Hi, YouTubers. I hope 2007 has gotten off to a good start for you. Some of you have written asking how things are going for me. Well, I'm happy to say that they're going well. It's cold outside, but my daughter, Gingeronymus, gave me a nice electric blanket, which I'm snuggled into right now. We've been looking at some of the old videos that she taped of me in 2003 when I was 90 years old. And even we find them quite fascinating. I'd like to share more of them with you because my memory was pretty good then. So without further ado, here are some more stories about my time in World War II in the Pacific. Well, when I joined the 13th Air Force, that organization was under Admiral Bull Halsey, the South Pacific Theater. MacArthur had the Southwest Pacific Theater. He stole the 13th Air Force away from Bull Halsey by initially borrowing, with Washington's approval, uh, borrowing a task force. And I was sent as one of the primary administrative officers of the 13th Air Task Force. And uh, one of the most memorable experiences I remember, we went from, went from the Solomon Islands over to uh, New Guinea initially, and then up in the, uh, to the northeast of New Guinea in the Admiralty Islands, the little island of Nos, Los Negros. I led a group of 23 people in several airplanes to establish a pioneer echelon in Los Negros. And uh, the first thing you have to do when you land on an island is uh, green, like we were, was uh, find out who the island commander is. There were Australia, there could be Australians, could be Navy, could be Air Force, could be ground troops, infantry, whatever. But the senior commander is automatically the island commander. And he has the authority to assign space on the island to any new units moving in. That I had to seek that man out. It was the commanding general, or no, the, the uh, yeah, the brigadier general commanding the uh, 7th Cavalry Division. They had fought their way ashore, just finished, not long before we landed there. Intelligence concerning enemy uh, troops on Los Negros was uh, erroneous. They were told you'll meet very little opposition. And uh, actually, the, the, uh, this general that I sought out, and was, uh, he was going to show me where we could have our area, uh, he told me that they had to fight their way ashore. The troops that fought ashore, he said, they had to drop their bags, their knapsacks, uh, to, to fight effectively. And they, they dropped them where they were, by units, and left them there. He interrupted his conversation and he said, excuse me, excuse me, just a minute. And he went down, there was a soldier going through a knapsack. And uh, he went down and he talked to the soldier, it was out of my ear sight, earshot. And uh, when he came back, he, uh, I observed him though, uh, he had the soldier take out his dog tags and show him. He checked the serial number on the knapsack, and he came back and he told me, he said, there's a lot of bad morale with the few soldiers that are dishonest and will rob the poker winnings or whatever, you know, the treasures that other people have in their knapsacks. He says, if I had found him rummaging through and helping ourselves to things from someone else's knapsack, I swear I think I'd have shot him on the spot. I wonder if he would have. One of the most serviceable units that the person could run into under those circumstances were the Seabees under the Navy. 
and the general knew where the Seabees were, and he went down and told the senior officer of the Seabees to clear out an area over here, and he designated it for the newly arrived Pioneer Echelon of the 13th Air Force Bomber Command. So they came over and they were real friendly. They came over and they used their uh, bulldozing equipment and cleared an area and then quickly went back to what they were doing. We cleared, by the time we put up our tents and everything, uh, it, it was the end of the day was at hand. Well, I insisted on putting out guards and keeping them out overnight in, in uh, two-hour shifts. Some of the men protested, why? Gee, you're surrounded by CBs and this and that, you know? And uh, uh, as we were preparing to retire, two British officers wandered into our area and we invited them to stay with us over I said, no, no, we're, we're sleeping out on the beach. Uh, we have our rucksacks and we, we're, it's nice and warm out there and we'll be very comfortable. We might join you for breakfast. Fine, come along. They didn't show up the next morning at breakfast time and I sent somebody over to, to wake them up and bring them in. They found them, they'd been decapitated in their, in their rucksacks. We heard dogs barking, we heard noises in the brush and everything, and there was the proof. When the 13th Air Force was first created, they had to get a cadre of officers from somewhere to serve temporarily until people like, like me, trained from Command and General Staff School or whatever, came and took over the job. Two of the officers who were responsible for administering those things were so busy writing a history of the war and their personal involvement in it that they weren't doing any of the paperwork. None of it. When I got back to the Barmer Command headquarters at Guadalcanal, there were footlockers, cases, full of all kinds of things. I asked the sergeant major, what, what's in all those cases? He was a little embarrassed. I had to find out for myself. Not one single recommendation for promotion, recommendation for awards and decorations for some of the most heroic actions you can imagine. Nothing had been processed. Nothing. There they sat idle in my office. I inherited that mess. Uh, I related all this later to General Matheny and uh, uh, he did his best to try and court-martial both of those officers. They got out by the skin of their teeth. They, they uh, faked uh, war-weary evacuation orders and, uh, and, and got out, went back to the States. But I had to clean up the mess.